bright duty every student matters hello guys welcome back to our lesson so today we have chapter 8 a history lesson which is titled harsha vardhana and his times so we are going to look at one of the rulers from the ancient period okay his name was harsha vardhana so we we'll look at how he came to ascend the throne how he came to the throne how he ruled what were the things that he did uh, what did he like how the people were during his time what were the military campaigns or whom did he fight uh, who defeated him etc all right so this chapter is all about harsha vardhana a very important ruler from the ancient period so let's begin now uh, we have to start from little before harsha vardhana's Uh, rule okay so uh, the gupta empire ruled uh, most of india uh, before harshavardhana became the ruler okay so now uh, the northern india was ruled by gupta kings or gupta rulers and uh, the gupta dynasty or the gupta empire came to an end okay now after the gupta empire came to an end uh, with its decline with the empire's decline there were large number of small kingdoms who now rose to power who became powerful who defeated other smaller kingdoms and became even more powerful okay now there were many such small kingdoms and they were constantly fighting with each other all right to become the most powerful than the neighbor than the others now out of all these kingdoms who were fighting for power and authority there were three strong kingdoms which emerged after the fall of the gupta empire these were number 1 the harsha the harsha ruler uh, of or harsha in harsha vardhana of uh, kanauj okay the harsha rulers of kanauj the chalukyas of vatapi and the pallavas of kanchi okay so number 2 were the chalukya kings and number 3 were the pallavas now the harshas ruled the north india the chalukyas were powerful in the deccan and the pallavas became powerful in south india okay so these were the three important kingdoms that emerged as strong and powerful kingdoms post the decline or after the decline of the gupta empire so that was the backdrop of uh, harsha vardhana's rule okay that was the background which we had to understand now let's move on to first topic where we'll start to learn about harsha vardhana okay so we'll begin with the year when he uh, came to the throne okay where he when he ascended the throne so it was 606 ad when he became the ruler when he was crowned the ruler and when he became the king he was just 16 to 17 years old so he was very very young okay now the time when he became a ruler the north india the regions in north india it represented great disorder chaos okay there was a lot of confusion a lot of fight fighting happening okay so during this time small kingdoms they were constantly in fight with each other they were constantly trying to overpower the other and become more powerful and have more authority okay now harshavardhana who emerged as one of the strong kingdoms or strong rulers he was a ruler of thaneshwar okay a small kingdom and kanauj so both thaneshwar and kanauj he was the ruler of these two kingdoms now what he did during his rule he brought all these uh, regional kingdoms who were fighting with each other under his reign okay under his rule he unified all these regional kingdoms and then with that he set up a vast empire of his own okay the harsha vardhana's empire all right so this map if you look at it the yellow portion Okay, the yellow shaded portion was the Harsha's or Harsha's empire. This was Harsha Vardhana's 
empire. Okay, so you can see how most of the north of India was occupied or under his control. Okay, you can also see Pallavas in the south and Chalukyas in the Deccan. These were another two important rulers of this time. Now let us look at Harshavardhana's military campaign. Whom did he fight with? Did he have to fight with his enemies? Or uh, if yes, whom did he fight? Now as soon as he became the ruler, he had to face his enemies. Now his immediate enemies were rulers of Gujarat and Bengal. Okay. So first what he did was his sister, okay, Rajya Shri was in danger. Okay, she was about to be uh, lit on fire as a sacrifice because she had lost or, or her, her husband had died. Okay, so when a woman's, a lady's husband dies during the ancient time, then the wife also had to burn herself in the funeral fire. So that custom was called Sat. So the same thing was going to happen to um, Harshavadana's sister in Kanauj, who was married to a ruler from there and who had recently died. Okay, so now the first thing Harshavadana uh, did was march to Kanauj to, sh to save his sister. Okay, and he was successful in doing that. And after that, he shifted his capital, which was in Thaneshwar, to Kanauj. And thus, he united Kanauj with Thaneshwar. Okay. The next uh, campaign that he launched was uh, to fight against the ruler of Bengal whose name was Sashank. Okay? Now this was basically a fight that he wanted to do as a revenge for the deaths of his brother Raja Vardhana and his brother-in-law Griha Varman who was the ruler of Kanauj. So to avenge the deaths of a very dear people that he lost he went uh, to he went to fight in Bengal with its ruler Shasha. Okay, over time Harsha Vardhana was able to conquer Punjab, Eastern Rajasthan, Bengal, Bihar, Urissa, and the whole of the Ganga Valley up to Assam. So you can see uh, from the map we just looked how he conquered most of the part of the northern part of India. Okay, after that. He launched a military campaign or expedition against the Chalukya ruler in the Deccan, whose name was Pulakeshin, Pulakeshin II. Okay, but this campaign was not successful. He was defeated by Pulakeshin II. Pulakeshin II was very another strong uh, emerging kingdom and ruler. Okay, so uh, Pulakeshin, uh, with the defeat of uh, Harsha Vardhana by Pulakeshin II, Narmada Valley, which lied or which was located in the southern uh, part of uh, Harsha Vardhana's empire, became the southern limit or the southern boundary of his empire. Beyond that uh, was Pulakeshin II's territory. Okay? Now, Harsha Vardhana annexed and captured many kingdoms and territories during his reign. Uh, as, uh, as a result of the military campaigns that he led. But he did not annex or he did not directly uh, control these uh, annexed or captured territories. Okay, What he did was he allowed the defeated rulers. Okay, He went and fought and defeated the, uh, the regional kingdoms, but he allowed those defeated rulers to continue to rule over their kingdoms by themselves. Okay. But in return, these rulers had to pay money or tribute uh, every year to Harsha Vardhana, supply him with money when he needed every month, and also supply Harsha Vardhana with soldiers or army during wars and battles. Okay, so this was the condition that he had applied to the defeated rulers. All right. Now, after the decline of Satavanas in the southern part of Harshavagana's empire, the Chalukyas in the Deccan and Pallavas in South India, they became very powerful kingdoms. Alright? Now, there was a very interesting person during this time whose name was Huensang. So, we'll do a little bit in detail about this 
a person, but for now, just remember he was a traveler, a Buddhist traveler who traveled across India during the time of Harsha Vardhan. Okay. Now, when Sang the traveler, he visited the court of the Chalukyan king Pulakesin II, the one who defeated Harsha Vardhan. Okay. And uh, when Sang, as he went around and traveled. He kept on writing or jotting down things that he observed which interested him about the rulers he met, about the courts that he visited, right? So as he went to the court of Pulakis in second, he saw how the king was, how the people were. So he wrote about them praising the king, praising the people as well. He also wrote about how the trade and economic activities of the Chalukyan Empire or the Chalukyan king, okay, uh, grew and prospered. It is quite good, okay. Uh, the Chalukyan king, Pulakasin II, traded with Iran, foreign countries like Iran, Arabia, and even with countries in the southeast of Asia, okay. Uh, the Chalukyan art and architecture was well developed. The Chalukyan rulers or kings were great patrons of art and architecture and provided support, financial support towards its development. Okay? They built several beautiful temples made of stone across their uh, kingdom. Some of them are Vatapi, Aihol, Padakata. Okay? Now these temples were dedicated to Lord Vishnu and Lord Shiva. Another important kingdom which we just learned was the Pallavas and with the decline of the Satavanas, they also emerged as very strong and powerful kingdom. Now Pallavas in South India, they were in constant battle and fight with the neighboring rulers. The so Chalukyas being one, Cheras, Cholas and even Pandyas. Okay, Huensang, the traveler whom we just learned about, who traveled to Chalukyan King Pulakitan II's court, he also uh, visited um, the Pallava ruler, okay? So he visited them and he wrote about them, alright? And he wrote that people in the Pallava kingdom, they were honest, they were honest people and they were followers of religions like Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism, okay? Even the Pallavas or the Pallava rulers were great patrons of art, architecture and literature. Just like the Chalukyas, they also built beautiful temples, a uh, very important and famous one in Mahabalipura. Even today it exists and one can visit it. Alright? Now let us look at Harsha Pardana, how he was a great scholar and also patron of learning. Okay? Harsha Pardana was very interested in learning and literature, art excited them. It interested them. Him, uh, it excited him and it interested him so much. So he was a great patron, encouraged. He encouraged and supported art and architecture and learning. Okay? He himself was also a scholar, a very learned scholar. He, uh, he had a very famous, uh, he had a very famous scholar whose name was Banabhatta. Banabhatta lived in the court of Harsha Vardhana. He wrote a very famous biography of Harsha Vardhana, a book on Harsha Vardhana. Its name is Harsha Charita. Okay? Now, Harsha Vardhana himself, being a very learned ruler, he wrote two plays in Sanskrit. In Sanskrit, alright? They were Ratnavali, Priyadarshika, and Navananda. Alright? Apart from Panabhatta, he also had other scholars in his court, and they were Subandhu and Dandi. All right. Now, apart from encouraging, supporting a scholars, learning, he also supported financially. He gave money donations to a university which was very popular during that time. That university's name was University of Nalanda. All right. Now, this University of Nalanda was a very famous center of learning during the time of Harsha Vardhana. Okay? Now let's look at Harsha Vardhana and Buddhism. Okay? Now Harsha Vardhana initially was follower of 
Hinduism, but later he followed Buddhism. All right. Now, his like his predecessors, the rulers before him, Ashoka, Kanishka, he Harsha Vardhana himself was a great patron of Buddhism. Okay, Ashoka, Kanishka were also very uh, um, were great patrons of Buddhism. Just like them, Harsha Vardhana also grew to be great patron of Buddhism. All right. Like I said earlier, he was a devotee of Buddhism, but later he accepted uh, Buddhism. Okay, and not only that, he took measures and steps to spread Buddhism. All right. So what he did was he built new monasteries, Buddhist monasteries, and repaired the old ones. All right. Like his predecessor Kanishka, he followed Mahayana Buddhism. So Buddhism also has different sects. Okay, all religions have different sects, right? Like Muslims have Shia, Sunni, um, Christians also have Buddhism. Also has Hinayana, Mahayana. Uh, Harsha Vardhana followed the Mahayana Buddhism. Okay, he organized fifth Buddhist council at Kanauj in sixty six forty one A.D. Okay, his predecessors Ashoka and Kanishka also had organized Buddhist councils in the past, all right? So he followed their steps and organized fifth Buddhist council at Kanauj in 641 AD, okay? Apart from these measures, he provided money, grants, land to the Buddhist monks for building monasteries, for their upkeep, etc. He also held or organized conference of Buddhist Sangha at Prayag, to donate and encourage the propagation of Buddhism annually. So these conferences were held annually, every year, okay? So that he can discuss with the people about Buddhism, about um, the scholars, Buddhist scholars, and also to encourage the spread of Buddhism, all right? So we learned about Huim Sam, the traveler, right? And we also very briefly came to learn about how he wrote about things that he saw, he learned as he travels throughout the country. Okay, so now let's look at little detail about Huen Sang and what he wrote about. So Huen Sang, I told you, he was a traveler. Okay, he was actually a Chinese Buddhist scholar who traveled across India during the time of Harsha Vardhan. He visited India in the year 630 AD. And he stayed in India for 15 long years. Out of this 15, he spent 8 years at Harsha Vardhana's court. So the account, the writings that he did in the 15 years, he wrote a book out of those writings. He compiled it into a book. And that book is called C.U.P. Okay? So this book provides detailed account of political, social, economic, and cultural condition of the Harsha Vardhana's dynasty or empire. So the book talks at length and great detail about how Harsha Vardhana's reign was, what was the people like, what was the ruler like, how was the ruler's relationship with the people, what was the village like, what was the market like, what were the religions followed by people, etc., etc., everything, okay? So Wen Sang's account is a very important source for learning about a Harsha Vardhana. Okay, now let's look at Harsha Vardhana's administration. How did he rule his empire? Harsha Vardhana's administration was decentralized. It was not centralized. He did not take control of everything under his uh, rule, under his authority. Okay, it was decentralized. He allotted us many responsibilities to his officers, okay, etc. So, uh, Harsha Vardhana's administration and how it was set up was similar to that of the Guptas, his predecessors, okay. Uh, he divided his empire into many provinces and those provinces were further divided into districts and the districts were again divided into many villages, okay. People living in the empire had to pay land tax, okay? And that ta land tax is called the land revenue. And how much tax did the people pay? It was one-sixth of the produce. 
So if they produced, say for example, six bags of a crop every year or every month, then one bag had to be given to the uh, ruler. Okay, so that was the tax. Now this tax was collected by revenue officials who were selected or who were recruited by the emperor or Harshavata. Now, it was not only the farmers and the villagers who were taxed, but even the merchants and craftsmen who traded, uh, made things, manufactured things, they were also taxed. They also had to pay certain tax. Okay. Now, what did all these tax uh, do? Well, how were these taxes used? So, these taxes that were collected from the people, the emperor or Harshavadana used it for maintaining its military, the army. Okay, the navy. And also, this was used for providing money, uh, making some charitable donation to the monasteries, to the temples, etc. Okay? Harsha Vardhana had very powerful army. It consisted of one lakh cavalry, okay, the uh, horse-mounted soldiers, the soldiers on horses, and 60,000 elephants. Okay, so it had uh, the Harsha Vardhana's army was large and well equipped. Okay, now let's look at the society uh, during Harsha Vardhana's reign and the life of people. How, what was the people's life like? Now, according to Huen Sang, we have to refer to Huen Sang's account to understand what the society was like, right? So, Huen Sang wrote that Harsha Vardhana was a kind hearted ruler. He was very kind towards his subjects and the people who lived in his uh, empire. And people uh, in Harsha Vardhana's empire led a very simple life, okay? They wore raw garments, they were not fancy, embellished, they were raw, and they walked barefoot. They didn't even wear sandals or shoes. The food that was eaten by the people was very simple, okay? And most of the people were vegetarians. They did not eat meat. The agriculture or agriculture was the main source of uh, livelihood for the people. Most of the people were engaged in agricultural practices or activities, okay? The people were generally very simple, honest and very hospitable. They were very kind to strangers, to travelers, okay? So the people lived very peacefully and pleasantly, happily, okay? The poor lived in thatched uh, houses which were made up of mud and the nobles and the priests or the rich, they lived luxuriously, okay? They lived in mansions, in um, palaces, okay? The caste system in the society was very rigid. It was not uh, loose, it was not flexible, it was very strict. So rigid means strict. Everyone had to follow the different caste systems and the rules uh, accordingly, all right? There was no parda system. The women did not have to cover their faces or their bodies. Okay? There was no parda system. But what was practiced was sati, okay? The burning of wife after the husband's demands on the funeral pyre of the husband. Okay, so that uh, practice was very prevalent. Now, uh, during Harsha Vardhana's reign, education was also provided to the people. But education was given in the temples and the monasteries. So if you were interested in learning during Harsha Vardhana's reign, we had to go to the temples or the monasteries to get uh, knowledge, okay? And some of the important centers of learning were Takshila, Ujjain, Gaya, and Nalanda. These were very important centers of learning, all right? Now, uh, in Nalanda and some of the learning centers that they just learned, Huen Sang uh, also visited, okay? And in Nalanda, he lived and taught uh, there. He taught the students at Nalanda and he lived there for many years. Okay. Now let's look at Harsha's assemblies. He formed assemblies, conferences, uh, these groups of people. Okay. So what uh, was this? Uh, what were these assemblies? 
Now Harsha Vardhana was a very tolerant ruler. He was tolerant towards all religions. He did not discriminate uh, irrespective of the religion. Okay. He convened, he organized two great assemblies. Okay. And these assemblies were for what? These assemblies were to discuss Buddhism and to discuss, to have a discussion with a wide range of scholars, varieties of scholars coming from different backgrounds, okay? And this was also to honor scholars, Buddhist scholars such as Wensa, and also to give publicity to the doctrines of Mahayana Buddhism, okay? To propagate Mahayana Buddhism, to spread Mahayana Buddhism. Okay, so these assemblies were uh, mainly held for the propagation and spread of Buddhism, for discussion with uh, Buddhist scholars and monks, etc., and also to honor and uh, to support them. Okay, uh, he held, Harsha Vardhana held an assembly or religious festival every five years at Prayag. So he also organized a religious festival at Prayag once in every five years, okay? Uh, one such assembly, actually, re religious festival, was held in the year 643 AD. And this was attended by the Chinese Buddhist scholar Wensang. Harsha Vardhana died in the year 647 AD. And with his death, there was emergence or rise of again many small independent kingdoms, okay? And with the decline or with the death of Harsha Vardhana, the Chalukyas and the Pallavas in the Deccan and the South, they now became, they now became more powerful and more strong, okay? <laughs>